I'll put it on you, please. Give it a test first. Just testing, testing. Brothers and sisters, we're just waiting for the Jana at the back to finish, just to give them uh, room to concentrate. So we'll just keep our voices down. I'm not starting until they're done, inshallah. Just give them some space. Thank <laughs> you. 
Brothers finished at the back? Finished? Okay. We ready? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My brothers and sisters, before we begin our lecture for tonight, I would like to briefly address the recent uh, attack, the incident on the bishop in Sydney, Bishop Marmari, I think his name is. So I just want to say a few words, inshallah, to my brothers and sisters, and also just to the general public, inshallah ta'ala. First and foremost, the Australian National Imams Council and the United Muslim Association has already and immediately sent out a statement condemning the attack on Bishop Marmari Emmanuel in Sydney. That's an Assyrian community mixed with a, I think, a cultic community. I think that's what their name is. And the Assyrian community is a Christian community. And uh, I'm very proud of the Muslim community to have made such a response. And I add my voice to the Australian National Imams Council and the United Muslim Association that I also condemned this attack and it was wrong. And it is against Islamic teachings. And the Assyrian community, we've lived among them. They were my neighbors for a very long time. And I still remember good memories with them, they were there for me and my family in tough times, and I was there for them in tough times. So as an essence, their foundation is good. And, you know, as a community, we don't have anything against them. And they don't have anything against us. We live in harmony together for a very long time. And I'd also like to say that, praise be to Allah, alhamdulillah, that the injuries sustained to Bishop Marmari were not more serious than that, alhamdulillah. He is still good and the injuries weren't worse. And I say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from being worse and the priest, the other priest who was with him. At the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also protected that kid, the 15 year old boy who attacked him, from any more serious damage than that. 
he could have caused the murder of someone and taken away a father from their family and their children. Worse, he could have been killed himself. So it was a very stupid and silly move and a move that was done as far as we know by himself. A young kid, 15 years old, who got hyped up and got a bit angry over some words that the bishop said and he decided to take the matter into his own hand and the only thing that came to his mind is to go into the church and try to violently attack the bishop. Which is very unfortunate and I'd like to make a little point here before I move on that these types of extremist moves happen in all followers of all religions. It's not just in the Muslim population, it happens in the Christian population, the Jewish population, the Buddhist and Hindu population, it happens everywhere. And I've heard some people, they say it's the belief system. No. As far as I know, and I've studied comparative religions, neither Islam, nor Christianity, nor even Judaism, even Buddhism and Hinduism, all these religions, none of them call to violence. But sometimes people may interpret teachings of their belief in their own way. Sometimes they could have mental illnesses that drove them to do this. And sometimes they could have been taught by someone who is unqualified, emotional, and gives them the wrong idea about the text in the religion. Especially, I can talk for Islam. And I heard this young boy, when they put him down, I heard what he was saying. And we all did. He said it in Arabic, in Lebanese. He's saying, he spoke about my religion, he spoke about my prophet, otherwise I wouldn't have come here. Which shows that the boy has a love for his prophet, Muhammad and love for his deen, religion. And we should all have the love for our religion. And he wants to defend his prophet. However, that is not the Islamic response, nor is it the teaching of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Allah says in the Qur'an, Say, if you love Allah, then follow me, meaning Muhammad sallallahu is speaking. Say, O Muhammad, to the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you love Allah, then follow me, Allah will love you. So we need to follow the practice and teachings of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa even in how we defend him and respond to any accusations or false statements. Now Bishop Marmari, he is a passionate uh, religious leader that believes in Christianity, or I think he said is orthodox, and he truly believes from all of his heart. And when he speaks, I've listened to a few of his talks, especially after this attack, and found that he is truly, I mean, I think he is very sincere about his own beliefs. And I tried to look for the vile comments that some people told me he said. And what I saw was he is talking about how different Muhammad وسلم, is to Jesus Christ. And he's trying to bring an argument or a debate, not more of a debate, more of an argument, a reasoning in his own way, to show us that Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, all of you, he, he spoke about all the religions, not just Muslims, in one of his lectures, that how can you compare any other man or prophet to Jesus Christ? Now one other clip that I saw, which is probably the one that triggered some people, and that is that he said, Muhammad, you Muslims believe that he died, he was buried, and he used a word that is not very nice. He said he rotted in his grave. While Jesus, you Muslims say and believe that he lived, he didn't die, and he was raised in the flesh to God. And then he brought the argument saying, well, which one would you prefer, Jesus or a man who died and now he's decomposed? Trying to say that Jesus Christ, as an argument, is more deserving of being the Son of God or God himself. Now, of course, we don't believe in that and disagree. There's many words we can refute it. However, that's not the point. What I'm emphasizing here is I don't personally believe he insulted the Prophet Sallallahu or insulted Islam really. It looked like he was giving an argument. And Allah tells us in the Quran, 
ولا تسمعون من الذين أوتوا الكتاب والذين أشركوا أذى كثيرا. You are going to hear many hurtful words from some of the people of the book and some of the polytheists. Words, a lot of bad words that will hurt you. In another verse of the Quran, Allah says, "Udru ila sabili Rabbi kabil hikmati wal mu'idat al hasna wa jadilhum bil ladhi hi ahsan." Call to the path of your Lord with wisdom and with a goodly exhortation and reason with them in the best manner. Allah knows the faith and beliefs of each person. Reasoning with someone means that they have said something which you're going to refute or you're going to disprove. So we're going to hear arguments by other people of different religions who disagree with our teachings and try to put their arguments forward. How do we respond? I have spoken to so many scholars here in Australia. Every single scholar, imam, sheikh that I know. And scholars abroad, I'm among my teachers and other scholars that I have spoken to about this matter, not a single one of them approved that the response is an attack, violent attack. Not one of them approved of this, here or abroad. Now this young boy is a kid, 15 years old. He came in and did this by himself. This is what we, are, we have seen. And it was just, he just acted on his own. It doesn't represent the Muslim community or Islam. And I ask Allah, I hope, that the religious imams in Sydney, if they have contact with this boy later on, to help him and to educate him and teach him the right way. And I think this is very important to bring up. We can respond with other arguments, educate ourselves about our deen and present arguments against the arguments that are presented to us. How many people around the world used to talk so badly about Islam and Muslims and our Prophet Muhammad and even some of them intended to attack Muslims and we've seen a lot of the attacks happening how many they killed for example in Christchurch and other places but also there are others who converted to Islam and now they're staunch defenders of Islam, of Muslims and of Prophet Muhammad so reacting this way is chaos and last thing I want to say Responding to something that is wrong has to be done with wisdom so that it does not cause a greater wrong. All the scholars of Islam teaching about religion, if you think something is wrong and you want to change it, then don't change it if changing it is going to cause more corruption and more evil and more wrong and more chaos. What was the result of this attack? Nothing. Nothing good. Only worse. More chaos, worse. And on top of that, uh, the bishop made prayers for the young boy. And I commend, I have to I say, I commend their priests and their bishops and their religious leaders for coming out and containing their people and calming them down. I also commend the police for doing a fantastic job, fantastic job, of... Cont of uh, uh, also keeping everything under control, while even some of the police members were attacked and injured. And I also commend the followers of uh, Bishop Murray Murray, uh, Murray Murray, that they did not react and retaliate by doing attacks and haphazard things against Muslims and the mosque. So Alhamdulillah, I think there is goodness in all these people and we need to dialogue better, discuss better and respond in a more wise manner. We need to seek the advice of the wise, intelligent elders. We need to seek the advice of our scholars and imams before we act in any way. These are not the teachings of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Especially living in the West, we have a great duty of showing what Islam really is. Can you imagine everyone who says something bad about another religion or a prophet? Everyone just goes on a frenzy, attacking violently and bashing and killing and doing this to everyone else. Where's the, how can deen be spread? How can harmony and peace be spread? And finally, I say also to the governments that they also have a role. And one of the great roles is to show the citizens fairness and justice for example, to be consistent in what you call terrorism and who you call a terrorist. To be consistent. 
It's up to the government to label and or, or to call or to judge who is and who isn't and what is and what isn't. It's their duty to protect their country. However, you need to be consistent in your approach so that the citizens can feel that their government is fair and just. Because when people feel there is injustice and inconsistency, then chaos continues and people feel unsafe. In injustice is the word we've already seen in the past uh, few months what's happened overseas and injustice has gone right through the roof. So I conclude by saying, brothers and sisters, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us guided on the straight path and to guide those who are astray and to let us understand the right from the wrong. And I urge my young brothers and sisters who love their religion and love their Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to please, number one, seek the advice of the qualified true scholars. Don't be a self-taught person who goes on the internet and then interprets the religion as you please. Because you could be doing more harm for your deen and for your Prophet وسلم, than doing any good. Finally, Rasul Muhammad وسلم, what is he? Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy to the whole world. So use the wisdom, think before you act, and seek the advice of the knowledgeable people around you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our youth, and if this young brother, this 15-year-old, has any mental illnesses which kind of, you know, you can't rule it out, or rule it out because the action is not really, doesn't look like the action of a person who is sane in his right mind, really. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heal him and cure him. And I hope, inshallah, ya Rabb, our brothers over there and the intelligent ones can help him reform and also look after the rest of the youth in guiding them in the right direction. We truly do leaders, need leaders and role models in this very crucial time to guide our community in the right direction. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among the sincere, the good, the honest, and those who follow right from wrong. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all the people who live in Australia and abroad who do not want anything but safety and peace for all. And at the end of the day, there will always be different religions, there will always be different opinions and different refutations forever. And our role is to educate ourselves, learn the, the approach of our Prophet, peace be upon him and his companions, and call to Allah with wisdom, compassion, intelligence and education, and that which is the best, as Allah commanded us in the Qur'an. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم upon Jesus عيسى عليه السلام upon Moses and all the prophets of Allah we make no distinction between them and they are all in our hearts and beloved even more than ourselves بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah most merciful most compassionate الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله my brothers and sisters the topic for tonight is interesting and I will leave some room for questions. Do you believe me or have I lost your trust? <laughs> you believe me, I will leave some questions, inshallah. So, the topic is really about looking at wealth and materialism from an Islamic perspective. And I would like to correct some misconceptions about it. So let me begin with a question. Can a Muslim be wealthy and rich? The answer to that, brothers and sisters, is an absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. In fact, being wealthy and rich can be a cause to support the Muslim community and the people at large and to serve your deen even better and become more pleasing and beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, we're going to go through the whole content about how being wealthy and having being resourceful is an excellent encouragement in the Quran and Sunnah. I begin with a hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. He said, اليد العليا خير من اليد السفلى وابدأ بمن تعول وخير الصدقة ما كان عن ظهر غني ومن يستعفف 
يعفه الله ومن يستغني يغنه الله The meaning of the hadith is as follows The hand that gives is better than the hand that begs and receives In other words financial independence is better than financial dependence The Prophet peace be upon him goes on by saying and start with your dependence first in who you give and spend on Abu Huraira said, Ya Rasulullah, who are, my, who are our financial dependents? He said, your wife, your children, and anyone who is dependent on you for their livelihood. You start with them first from your wealth, before anyone else. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the best type of charity, listen carefully, is from what is left over beyond one's financial needs, meaning your savings and profit. Which is the best charity? After what you spend on yourself, your wife, your children, your dependents, whatever's left over that you don't need for your family and your livelihood, your shelter, your clothing, your food, your security, and so on, left over, the best charity you can give is from that. Why? Because there's a priority. Dependents take priority. And being obliged to spend on your dependents is more beloved to Allah. Because no one else is going to spend on them but you. Also, spending on your dependents is an obligation which is also considered a charity. In fact, it is the best charity of all charities. What is obliged is the best charity of all charity. He goes on, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever is able to not need to ask from others, Allah will make him unneedy. You stop yourself from asking people for loans, asking people for whether it's money or anything else. Don't go into that habit. Avoid it as much as you can. Allah says He will make him unneedy. Then He says, Whoever is satisfied, whoever is satisfied with what they have, Allah will bless their wealth and their wealth will increase. Or it also means whoever relies on their abilities, Allah bless them with, and seeks financial independence, Allah will assist him in his seeking and his efforts. So what have we understood from this? A Muslim should be financially independent as much as they can. If they're not yet, then to seek it and to work and not sit and wait and use justifications and excuses that Allah is going to provide them without moving and also not to beg and ask and get out of that habit and also that your family and dependents are more worthy come in priority and it is haram to neglect them even in the name of charity to others and that the best charity is to your dependents first and then the next best charity is what's left over of your wealth to others and that obligation towards your family is a charity you get rewarded for. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu says to the Prophet peace be upon him, who are those you said are the dependents or messenger of Allah? And he said, your wife. So that your wife does not say, my husband, you, are, you have neglected me, so leave me. I can't live with you. Or your child says, O oh father, you have left me barren and vulnerable, where do I go? These are the words of the Prophet ﷺ. Allah says in the Quran in Surah number 4 verse 9 in Surah An-Nisa, He says, وَلْيَخْشَ الَّذِينَ لَوْ تَرَكُوا مِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّةً ضِعَافًا خَافُوا عَلَيْهِمْ and let them fear those who, if they would themselves leave behind helpless children, they would surely have been fearful on their account. Let them then fear Allah and make the right statement. What does this verse mean? Allah is telling us that there is a legitimate fear of poverty upon your children and your family if you were to die and leave them behind 
with no financial resources or wealth that they can look after themselves when you die. This is a misconception among Muslims where they say, not this, there is a misconception among Muslims where they say, Allah will provide, will provide them. It is absolutely true that Allah will provide them. But Allah also has already provided us these resources and the ability to work and He commanded us to do that. So anything which Allah commands us to do, it means we take some of that responsibility and the responsibility is to do our part. In the end, if Allah provides you from or doesn't, that's in the hands of Allah. And everyone's provision is written, but you have to still work towards it. And even your working towards it is written. Allah facilitates everything fairly and justly. And the meaning of this verse is that some people, when they, before they die, they want to donate and give in charity all their wealth. Or they start giving their wealth to certain people than others. Or they name it for some of their children rather than others. Or they hide it or whatever it is. Allah is telling them, let them fear that they leave behind an offspring who will be barren and vulnerable. So fear Allah. Do you understand? Allah did not say, give your wealth away and don't worry about your children, I will provide them. No, no, no. Providing comes in two ways. That Allah provides you without you asking and He also provides you with you doing the effort. The Hadith Prophet is very clear. It says Allah will assist the person when they do the effort. Inheritance, therefore, is important. And how can you leave behind wealth for your children and family if you yourself are not wealthy and you yourself have not doesn't seek now we're not talking about people around the world who are disadvantaged because of the, the, the oppression and corruption of their governments or because of war or because of uh, circumstances disasters those people they have to be patient and Allah subhanahu wa will still provide them we're talking about people whom Allah subhanahu wa has given them security and safety in their land do you have you heard of the companion named Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas is one of the elite companions, when I say elite may be the wrong word, one of the most important companions and the highest of the righteous among the earliest Muslims and he was the uncle, the paternal uncle the maternal uncle of the Prophet and he embraced Islam early and he was one of the ten mentioned in the hadith in a row promised paradise. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas was among the most affluent and wealthy companions among all the companions. His honor and his dignity was respected and revered, and he was a great help to the Muslim community with his wealth and his resources. In the farewell pilgrimage, after the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave his sermon, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas became ill, and he thought that he was going to die. The hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. So he said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, when he went to visit him, Ya Rasulullah, I feel that I'm going to die. And I have all this wealth. I am very comfortable with wealth. All I have is one daughter. Can I give two-thirds of my wealth in charity to someone else and just leave a third for my daughter since I only have a daughter and a wife? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. No, don't do that. He said, how about a shatr, mis, half, half of all my wealth, and I leave the rest for my daughter and my wife. He said, no, not allowed to do that. He said, how about a third? And Rasul Sallallahu said, if you want, you can donate a third, but even that is too much. In other words, it discouraged him. One daughter, one wife. Now, Sa'd Abi Waqqas did live on, live on after that, and he had many children after his daughter. And subhanAllah, his wealth benefited the Muslims, benefited him, benefited his family. And the Prophet وسلم, he replied to Sa'd Abi Waqqas saying, in min For you to leave your family and children wealthy, independent financially from needing other people is much better to Allah and more beloved than to allow them to go and beg people and rely on the community to help them. Do you understand my brothers and sisters? Now here is another thing. Rasul 
the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to seek refuge from poverty. Another misconception is people think that the Prophet liked to be poor or that, or that he was poor. This is wrong. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi neither liked poverty nor was he poor. But Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi chose to have only the minimum finances for himself and his family and he always gave it away. He chose to be an ascetic, zuhd. Why? Because he's the role model and he's the messenger of Allah. He used to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith is in An Nasa'i, Sunan An Nasa'i. The companion's name is Maslam ibn Abi Bakr. He said, My father, I found my father. His father is a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. This was after the death of Prophet. He said, I used to see my father making the following dua after every salah, five times a day. He used to say, Allahumma, in, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al kufri wal faqri wa adhab al qabri. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al kufri wal faqri wa adhab al qabr. Oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from disbelief, kufr, and poverty, and the punishment of the grave. So I used to say them after my father. Then my father said to me, my son, where did you learn this dua from? And, my, and he said, I learned it off you, O father. And then his father said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to say this same dua after every salah. The hadith is authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani. So what is the combination between kufr and poverty? He said, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from disbelief and poverty. Why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam put these two together? I'm here to educate you, brothers and sisters. I'm not here to motivate you for, for nothing. We want to learn on a deeper level. Why is poverty and kufr put together? And what type of kufr disbelief is the Prophet said, I'm talking about? Here's the answer, brothers and sisters, from the scholars. Poverty, they said, leads to desperation. And desperation leads to selling your dignity and honor. And it leads you to dealing with haram to survive and may lead to disbelief or doing acts of disbelief in order to survive. And Rasul called it kufr. And kufr has two meanings. It means real disbelief from the heart. And kufr also means kufr of action, which doesn't make you a real disbeliever. And kufr also means a third meaning, and that is to be ungrateful and to deny the blessings you have. So to say words that are ungrateful. And poverty can do that to people. So Rasul Sallallahu sought refuge. Now if somebody's in need and is struggling and the only means of survival is going through haram, then they are exempt and there's no sin upon them. But some people, poverty does lead them to even leave Islam. Another meaning is that, is, Oh Allah, do not make me incapacitated so that you are unable to, so that I am not able to give and help others, making a person dependent on those above them and have no option but to, but to certain things that may compromise their religion and faith. Oh Allah, do not make me among those. Now here is uh, another hadith, beautiful dua that you can say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al hammi wal hazan. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from worries and sadness. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْعَجْزِ وَالْكَسَلِ And I seek refuge in you from being incapacitated and from laziness. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْجُبْنِ وَالْبُخُلِ Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from being cowardice, a coward, and from stinginess. وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنْ غَلَبَةِ الدَّيْنِ وَقَهِ الرِّجَالِ And I seek refuge in you, Allah, from the debts overcoming me and from the power and authority of men. Don't make me below them so that I have to beg and cover and do whatever they tell me and lose my dignity. Listen to this amazing dua of a great companion named Sa'd ibn Ubadah radiallahu anhu. Sa'd ibn Ubadah is also from his paradise and he was one of the Ansar among the early Muslims and he was a leader and a chief of one of the tribes of Medina. I, I haven't heard this dua from any other, narrated from any other companion. Listen to it. He said, 
اللهم هب لي مجدا ولا مجد إلا بفعال ولا فعال إلا بمال اللهم لا يصلحني القليل ولا أصلح عليه أو ولا أصلح عليه أو ولا أصلح عليه He says Oh Allah grant me honor and value grant me honor and value and I cannot have honor and value without action and giving and there cannot be any action and giving without financial resources Oh Allah Limited financial resources do not make me adequately functionable. They don't suit me. And I cannot adequately function without having abundance in wealth. It's very clear. Allah, I want honor and value. I cannot have it without action and giving. And I cannot act and give without you making me wealthy and rich. And not being rich doesn't suit me. I can't function like that. And if I am poor, it incapacitates me. I can't live like that. The hadith is in Al-Hakim, uh, narrated it, Ibn Abu Shayba, Ibn Sa'ad, and Al-Bayhaqi. And the hadith is authentic and very well known. And you know what? As a result of that dua, Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, radiallahu anhu, listen carefully. Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he migrated from Mecca to where? To Medina. How long did he spend in Medina? 10 years. So each year is 300, let's say 365 days. How many days would 10 years be? 365 times 10 years. Don't worry, I've already done the calculation. 3,650 3, days approximately. Do you know what Sa'd ibn Ubadah did as a result of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granting him that wealth and that dua? He used to gift the Prophet peace be upon him a gift every day. Sometimes a shoulder of a lamb, sometimes a, a goat, sometimes something else. Every single day for 10 years, he gifted him 3,650 gifts. How? Because he was able financially. Now, if that's what he did for the Prophet Sallallahu imagine what he did for his people, for his family, for the Muslims, for the community and abroad. Adding to that, you know the 10 promised paradise among the companions. There are more promised, but in that hadith there are 10. Did you know that seven out of those ten were extremely wealthy? Among them was Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. We all have heard about Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, how wealthy and powerful he was. Did you know that scholars have estimated in today's US currency of how much approximately Abdul Rahman ibn Awf had in dinars compared to today's modern world? They estimated his wealth to be at least 800 million US dollars. That was his entire life uh, and wealth. He was worth 800 million US dollars in modern world. So was Uthman radiallahu anhu, Ibn Affan, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Umar radiallahu anhu, all of them. Ali radiallahu anhu started off poor. He started off poor. And he married Fatima radiallahu anha, the daughter of the Prophet And they were extremely poor and it was very hard for them. He was quite young. And one day he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Ya Rasulullah, I am suffering from poverty. He waited and the man came in and gave some donations of a few dinars. Or dirham, sorry. Dirham is less than a dinar. Dirham is, what, I don't know, maybe about seven dollars Australian. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received this. And what did he give Ali with Allah? He gave him one dirham. One. And he said, go to the market and buy yourself such and such dates or whatever. And then go and sell them for a profit of such and such. Then take that profit and bring it back to me. He went and did exactly as the Prophet ﷺ said. He came back with some profit. He said, now take it again and buy this or that. And sell it again and make some profit. And again and again until he had enough for his family to last him for a little while. And so Allah began a business of profit. So a Muslim invests, a Muslim profits, a Muslim gets into trade and business if they can, a Muslim educates themselves, a Muslim reads books about how to invest in business, a Muslim reads about the boundaries that Islam has placed in how to invest in a halal way and what is haram, in how to earn your wealth in halal and what is haram, in how to spend it in halal and how to spend it in haram. A Muslim reads before they even earn money, what does Islam, you have to study, it is a, a, an ob obligation. <clears throat> Anything you're about to do in life, it is an obligation to study that area of your deen. Seek advice from scholars or read a book about it on Islam. 
from Islam about that topic. So let's say finance. What is halal finance? What is haram? How do you spend it? What are your obligations? Who has to receive from your wealth? What is zakah? What is sadaqah? How much do you have to give? And so on. Then be wealthy as wealthy as you like. But don't forget Allah's right. Islam does not base your value on whether a person is rich or poor. Islam looks at your obedience to Allah, your worship, your conduct, and whether that wealth enters your heart and changes you, becoming stingy, miserly, full of arrogance and pride, or whether poverty makes you a person who leaves the deen and blames Allah and so on and so forth. It's all a test. Wealth is a test. Poverty is a test. Everything in our life is a test. My brothers and sisters, some people say, well, what about the verses in the Quran? Al-haakum at Abundance has made you heedless. You might say, huh, there you go. The verse of the Quran is warning us not to have abundance of wealth because it makes us heedless. No, no, no. Read it again. Allah is not saying abundance makes you heedless. He's saying your accumulation of your abundance has changed you so that you became heedless because of it. So therefore it's not the wealth. It's how you looked at wealth. How you approached wealth. Not that wealth makes you heedless. Wealth makes you more powerful. You have a more say in government, politics, in the economy of a country, in your say, in your influence on powerful people. Yes, that is true. And that is why I always encourage the Muslim communities that we need to always work together to find ways of employing one another, making resources available for each other, to help each other grow, train each other, assist one another so our community can grow and be strong, powerful, independent financially and not need anybody. Another thing that Islam looks at is this. Don't be a person who takes out loans all the time unless it's necessary. Islam discourages, even looks, frowns upon it deeply. If a Muslim is used to always asking people and getting a loan for no, nece no necessity. Asking for a loan is dangerous because you may not be able to pay it off. Asking for a loan when you don't need it is even worse because you will be denying other Muslims who have that wealth to invest and grow. For example, if I come up to you and I have alhamdulillah enough wealth, but I see a business opportunity, I want to borrow that money off you so that I can invest it and make profit. And then I give you back just that money as it was after a year. Then I have harmed you. You could have invested and grown your wealth and helped your family. But instead I took it and invested. And it's not haram. It's okay. But it's frowned upon in Islam. Because the wealth of the Muslims are meant to circulate and help each other. And assist one another to become stronger. The, there is a hadith which makes me really think. In a tirmidhi, the hadith is authentic. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to pray a janazah on a man. For, uh, for a man. Sorry, the word is not on. For a man. Janazah salat. He had died, one of the companions. And it was the habit of the Prophet sallallahu to always ask, does your brother, your companion or your sister have a debt still owing? And this man had a debt still owing. I think it was about 70 dinars, something like $7,000 Australian. They said, Ya Rasulullah, he still owes a debt. He hasn't paid it off. And he was able. Rasul Sallallahu said, Sallu ala akhikum. You go and pray. And he refused to pray. Not because he doesn't deserve it. But Rasul Sallallahu dua, one, he wants it to be accepted. And because of that, he doesn't want his dua to be refused because of that. Again, he, he, he's discouraging the companions from getting used to asking people and going to debt unnecessarily. One companion put his hand up and said, Ya Rasulullah, I will settle his debt so long as you pray for him. He said, is that an agreement in contract? He said, yes. He witnessed the companions as a witness and said, very well. 
So if you have somebody, that's why people should make a will. If you owe debts, make sure you have someone else who will carry out to pay off that debt for you. After a few days, he saw the companion and said to him, did you pay the debt off your brother? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I was busy. Then after another few days, he said, now I paid it, Ya Rasulullah. Now, this part of the hadith, I'm not sure of its authenticity, but it is still scary. It says, now his skin has cooled down. Only Allah knows best. I'm not, I can't guarantee this part of the hadith to be authentic, but there is a frowning upon people who seek loans unnecessarily. Brothers and sisters, finally, we find that wealth can get to our hearts and minds and destroy our relationships and destroy our obligations and make even blood relatives become enemies. I've seen it in business dealings, in business partnerships, in inheritance. A father dies, a mother dies, the children start to divide and fight over the inheritance. Audhu billah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly stipulated exactly whose right is what. And we heard about those two men who entered upon the Prophet Dawood, David, Dawood alayhi salam, one of the greatest judges. And they were in fact angels in the form of humans. To test Dawood alayhi salam, to teach him a lesson, Allah wanted to teach him something. They acted like they were two partners in a business. And one of them said, my brother here, my partner, did this and that to me. And uh, he took my wealth and didn't repay me, such and such. Dawood alayhi salam was still asleep and he had woken up. And he was a bit distorted. And he said to them, immediately without hearing the other side of the story, your partner has oppressed you, he owes you this and he owes you that, now go. And they left. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to him, Jibreel, to tell him, you have dealt with them unjustly. You did not hear the other side of the story and you gave judgment. So, the Quran says that Dawood went down in prostration to the ground and he came closer to Allah and asked him for his forgiveness. Allah tested him. What did he test him with? A judge cannot judge when they are not fully aware. So he just woke up. Number two, when they're distraught. Number three, it, without hearing both sides of the story. And number four, if there is conflict of interest. But what Dawood said here that I want to highlight, he said to them, وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْخُلَطَاءِ لَيَبْغِي بَعْضُهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّ Many partners in dealings and business, majority of them, they transgress each other and do wrong by each other except very few whom Allah has given mercy. So fear Allah in your partnership dealings and your transactions. And fear Allah. There is a whole ayah you know what an ayah is? What's an ayah in the Quran? A verse. For example, wadduha, that's an ayah. Sometimes the ayah is a bit longer. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, that's longer. Sometimes it's a few lines. Sometimes it's half a page. And sometimes it's only one time in the entire Quran. There is one ayah that appears the entire page. One whole page from top to bottom, 15 lines. That's one ayah. Who knows where this ayah is? Surah Al-Baqarah. Who knows which page? Page 48? No, further, further. Close. I mean, you're closer than one. So 48 is closer. Okay, you can say second last. Yeah, yeah. That's right. About the second last page. No. So maybe... You know what, brother? I even don't know. Maybe it's 148. Allahu A'lam. Someone can check it for us. But it's actually the second last page. This or the third last page. One whole ayah dedicated. If the imam recites that in prayer, brothers, you should learn the first part. Because just before you join the prayer, some people might want to not stand very long saying, let me see what he's going to read. <laughs> I'll see if I can follow him or not. If he starts with, I'm just joking. When he starts with this ayah, no, it's the whole page. Why is this ayah so long and why do we have to finish it? Ah, who knows what it's about? Brother said it's about riba. Huh? Debts. Dain. It is called the ayah of, of Dain, of debts. And you said riba. Someone else said. 
Okay. Inheritance? Type. No, it's not about inheritance. It is called the ayah of debts. In fact, it doesn't just talk about debts, it talks about contracts, debts, how to witness debts and how to write it. It talks about transactions. Let's see. I'm not going to recite the whole verse. I'm just going to give you the summary, the points, the important points it, it discusses. Number one, it says, and these are my words, of course, I'm just summarizing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beware leaving behind financially. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped. It says, number one, right, so it's verse, uh, it's chapter number two, verse 282. Verse 282. It says, if you enter into a loan agreement, then you must write it down. That's the first thing it says. You must what? You must write it down. Some people, because they're their friend or their relative or their father or mother or their brother or their sister, they think that if they write it down, they take it as if it's a distrust. Wrong. We have to stop this trend and this misconception. It is an obligation to write it down. Number two, or get an independent person to write it and he shouldn't refuse. Get someone else to write it if you like. The point has to be written. Number three, the debtor dictates to the writer what to write. This, the next point. Fear Allah and detail every term clearly. You have to be very detailed and clear. The next point. If the debtor is not fit enough, maybe they're not very mature enough, let their guardian write it on his or her behalf. Do you see how much writing is so emphasized? And Allah then says, two trustworthy men have to witness to the agreement. And if you cannot find two trustworthy men, Allah says, then one trustworthy man and two trustworthy women. Why? Because Allah says, if one woman forgets, the other one reminds her. But then you might say, what, in this day and age, women work with... The answer to that, brothers and sisters, is not that women are less uh, knowledgeable or less logical or less rational or less in their brain or their mind. No, this is a misunderstanding. It is because the nature of majority of women. Number one, it's not an obligation for women to financially be responsible for families, which then causes that, necessitates that many women throughout time and even in the world today will not be dealing much with finances unless she wants to. Number three, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that since the obligation of finance is not on women, therefore a woman may, because she's not involved in it all the time, she may forget. She may be pregnant, she may be going through uh, child rearing and so on and so forth, where she has, she has more likeliness to forget what it was. So write it down. Anyway, Allah then says, the witnesses must not refuse if called to give evidence later. The next one, no slackness or negligence in dealing, in detailing the transactions and the terms. Then Allah says, must clearly write the terms due date. Then he says, the fair, this is fairest and more just so that there are no ambiguities, doubts or accusations later on. Then Allah says, but immediate transactions like a sale or a purchase that is on the spot, you are not obliged to write it, but it is preferable to write it, i.e. invoices and receipts. And lastly, the scribe, the person who wrote it, must never be threatened or caused any harm. So, brothers and sisters, this whole ayah is talking so much about the rights of people's finances and debts that it must be in this manner. Do you see how important it is, brothers and sisters? One brother asked me on a side note, do I have to tell my wife if somebody has borrowed some money from me? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Should he tell his wife? Huh? What if he's hiding money, doesn't want his wife to know in case they leave each other and then she goes after it? Some men do that, don't they? Should he hide it from his wife? What do you think I advised him? Huh? If it affects the family? If it affects the family, should hide it? Should hide it. Yeah, and his wife is still with them and they're living normal, like husband and wife. There's none of that threat or anything on either side. Normal. Yeah, have your ups and downs. 
Okay, alhamdulillah, people on the camera looking at me don't see you because some of you are shaking, some of you are nodding. Uh, the answer I gave to this brother is he should tell his wife. Who knows why, but why do you think I said that? Huh? If he dies, what? Yes, what? What's the consequence if he dies? Why would I tell him, tell your wife? <laughs> no. Okay, she ha okay, you're on the right. She says that's like her money. Not all of it is her money. Okay, don't put us into a big problem now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Marsh, because time, time, can I, can I answer it, Because time is running out. Forgive me, brother, sister. I know that you know the answer, mashallah. Aren't there rights in, in wealth to other people? Does the wife inherit anything? Do the children inherit anything? Part of that wealth, she has a right to it. And if she doesn't know that someone is owing them, how does she go after her rights? Taib, you might say, I'll let his brother or let his father or let... Yes, you can do that. But eventually she must know. And it is better to let your wife know and your husband know. Even your children to know. Because the person who has the right will go after that right as well. Don't hide these things. So my brothers and sisters... As you can see, therefore wealth in Islam is encouraged on one condition that you give your zakah, you give sadaqah. It doesn't change your heart to neglect your duties to Allah or the community and the Muslims. That you use your wealth in the right way, not in the haram way. That you prioritize those who have a right to it first, yourself, your wife, your children and then others. That you earn it in halal and you spend it in halal. And there's nothing wrong with driving a nice car, wearing nice clothes. A man came, I'll end it with this. A man came and said, Ya Rasulullah. Rasul he said, Whoever wears a, a, a garment to show off with will be given a garment of the fire on a day of judgment. One man said, Ya Rasulullah, I like to wear nice shoes. He said, That's different. Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah is beautiful and He loves to see beauty. Right? He said, I am talking about the person who is arrogant, ungrateful to Allah, considers himself independent of God's provision. When you ask them, they say it's me and only me and denies Allah's favors and denies other people their right and sees himself superior to others because of the garment he or she is wearing. Same with the car, same with your hat, same with your glasses, same with whatever you wear. A Muslim humbles themselves. In another hadith, Rasul Sallallahu he said, Inna Allah yuhibbu an yara athara ni'matihi ala abdi. Allah loves to see the effect of his blessings on his slave. So when he gives you, he loves to see its effect. But the believer thanks Allah for it. And, it's, and doesn't connect his heart to it. I say my final statement. There are people who are financially independent, but the finances control them. And there are those who are independent of financial dependence. I repeat, there are those who are financially independent, but they're dependent on their money. And there are others who are financially, who are independent of their financial dependence. Money is secondary to them. They always have the abundance mentality. If it goes, they don't lose hope. They always say, Alhamdulillah, it will happen again. And my risk is with Allah. If they donate, they don't say, Oh my God, I'm going to starve. They say, Allah will provide me. And the wealth becomes a means, not an ends. So that you don't compete to it. You don't disunite because of it. You don't make it your everything in your life and make it the most beloved thing to you and put your duties and your obedience of Allah and the rights and your uh, moral values behind the money as if the money becomes your God. Does everybody understand the lecture that we gave today? I hope so, Ya Rab. Uh, I told you I'll give you time for your questions. But is it time for Aisha? It's time for Aisha. Five minutes. It's five minutes. Okay. I'll have five minutes. Questions. Anyone. And sisters are up there. You can also ask your question on Instagram. Uh, on the Preston Mosque. Instagram, inshallah, brother. Yeah, I'll take one question. Try to answer as many as I can. Is the haram to look at the back of the living room? 
Sorry? The brother's asking, would it be haram to work at a bank because they deal with riba? This is a controversial uh, question. I don't know the correct answer to that. I would advise brothers and sisters, if they can avoid working at a bank, avoid it. But a number of modern day scholars have told us that if you are not dealing directly with the riba transaction, you're not facilitating the riba transaction, then you're okay to be a bank teller, for example, or the person who works in other areas of finances of savings. So merely working in the bank by itself is not haram. It's what you do in the bank, what your position is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Of course, this needs more explanation, but um, just as and seek more advice, inshallah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So if if you are driving a nice car, wear nice clothes. Yes. You're more prone to getting an evil eye. So how would you cater that if people? Brother was asking an interesting question. You wear nice clothes, you drive a nice car, and you're afraid of the evil eye. The first thing I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, is don't be afraid of the evil eye. Don't be afraid of the evil eye, and say before you get into your car in the morning a beautiful zikr. Re recite the the three quls. Qul adu rabbil nas, qul adu rabbil falak, qul huwa Allahu ahd. I taught my children to do this with their palms, recite from their palm like this, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do it, and then wipe over your head and go. Another dua, again I always tell people, download Fortress of the Muslim from App Store, Fortress of the Muslim, Hassan al Muslim, beautiful dua book, and you'll learn a, a, a dua in there says, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika, a'udhu billahi, a'udhu bi kalimatillahi, tamma, min kulli shaytanin wa hamma, wa min kulli aynin lam. Seek refuge in Allah from every creature that is harmful and from every evil eye. And inshallah, you will be fine. Any other question? Yes. Uh, is there a minimum button that you must Is there a minimum debt? Uh, is there a minimum what you have to write down? Brother is asking, is there a minimum that what you have to write down in a debt? No, no, there is no minimum or maximum. It's whatever you need. Mm. Um, I only heard half the question, I'm really sorry, brother. Can someone maybe close that if you heard it? If you discuss it over iMessage, for example, is that If you discuss it over? Over the phone. I discuss it over texting. Yeah, yeah, of course you can. In any way you can discuss it. But eventually you need to meet and write it down. And you need to get two witnesses. So write it, get them to sign it, or even verbally they witness. Yeah, and it, the, the idea is write it somewhere where it's safe and it can be preserved. Okay. Tawadda li akhi. What's some of the things that you've seen Muslim people abroad here do together to build up that wealth practically? Yeah. Right? Like what do you Good. Forums, yep. What have they done? Like yes. Yeah. Yes. What, what have they done? Great forums? Um, Oh, what have the Muslims done to, to, to initiate things like this? I don't know, brother. I know a lot of Muslims here and abroad, alhamdulillah, they have made a lot of initiatives, but you just have to increase your network. So that's another topic now. There's a way to increase our networks. I know many Muslims, mashallah, who I've met in the UK and other places, and even here in Australia and interstate, they do have a network, mashallah, they've gone into business um, building, and what they do is they, um, they create investment opportunities. There's an organization here, my center, who's now opened up an investment opportunity into what they're building. So the idea is you've got to ask, you've got to research, go to the mosque, go to organizations and ask, right? Um, so I don't want to mention names here on, on, on camera and in public, but Muslims are, alhamdulillah, creating uh, amazing um, business and uh, investment uh, uh, plans, alhamdulillah. Tawadda uh, Brother. Yeah, because one from the sister. Please forgive me, Abu Ayman. Yeah. Is Islamic banking halal? Is Islamic banking halal? This needs a lot of explanation. Because when we say the word bank, what do we mean by that? Islamic finance, what do we mean by that? The only way to tell is that you, it has to, you have to show it to a qualified uh, 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 scholar who knows both the uh, conventional system and the Islamic system of finance and looking at the contract itself. I can't, you can't give a general answer to that. You've got to look at the terms of the contract. The difference between a halal and a haram transaction or a loan is to look at the terms of the contract and then you can determine. So, Islamic banking, Islamic finance, it depends on their system and the terms in their contract. I cannot give you an answer just like that, brothers and sisters.
final question. Abu Ayman. No, brother is asking, can I do it based on gold? So give a kilo of gold and then in two months' time you give me back a kilo of gold. No. No. Rasul Sallallahu said that these types of transactions have to be uh, immediate. Gold for gold, silver for silver. Yeah, yeah, I know, because the gold price in two months' time will be higher or lower. Therefore you return the riba or receive the riba. That's a big topic. Maybe, inshallah, when I come back. Last question, I need to make a quick announcement. I'm very sorry, Akhi, behind you. Okay. Um, the loans, if it's taken or given, is a bank statement a description uh, sufficient? Brother is asking if a bank statement of a loan is sufficient. Yes, inshallah, that is written and it's witnessed. Inshallah, yeah, anything that is secure. Now, finally, I just need to make an announcement, brothers and sisters. Two announcements. The first one is that the mosque here, the masjid, Where's Yahya? So the masjid will be closed at 8 p.m. every night until further notice because of what's the events that have happened. They just want to keep take precautions. So every day at 8 p.m. the masjid will be closed. And when will it, when will it open? No, Fajr. Before Fajr it will open up. So uh, just we need to make that announcement. And the second announcement, brothers and sisters, uh, I'm going overseas, inshallah, next Wednesday. I'm not going to be here, so we're not having a class next Wednesday. I'll be going for about three weeks, and inshallah, when we return, we'll recommence our weekly Wednesday classes. So I'll be back, inshallah, when I'm back. <laughs> I'm not going to let you know. <laughs> but when I get back, I promise you, from now, inshallah, in three weeks' time, that Wednesday, I'll be here, inshallah. Make dua for us. Hada wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Forgive me those who had questions I couldn't answer. Wassalamu alaikum.